Hello and welcome to this, my fourth video on developing the Arduino FPGA Shield. Now, in today's video, we're going to pick up where we left off, talking about SPI configuration, and specifically looking at how we multiplex the SPI bus, which is going to allow two masters, the FPGA and the Arduino, to access that single SPI slave, in this case, our SPI flash. Now, likewise, we're going to take a look today at SRAM, and I've gone ahead and added SRAM to the design. This is largely because the FPGA memory resources are expensive. Block RAM inside of an FPGA is expensive by contrast to, say, an external memory device. So today we're going to take a look at implementing SRAM. And this is going to enable us later on to do things like include a processor core inside of the FPGA and have plenty of space to put all of the data that we're generating when the program is running on board that processor. Likewise, it's SRAM. It's easy to access, so we can use it for all sorts of storage while the system is up and running. So, that said, let's go ahead and dive straight into it. Now, I've gone ahead and updated the schematics. Everything that I've done so far has been checked into Git. Uh, you'll see all of the updates that I've made, and a lot of stuff has been happening behind the scenes despite the videos not coming out as quickly as I had hoped. Now, over here on the left, we've got our FPGA subsystem. Here in the middle, we've got our SPI multiplexer and SRAM. I've added both of these to the design. Off here to the right, I've got the flash memory on this subsheet. So taking a look at our SPI MUX here first, I've got basically two interfaces here, SPI config FPGA and SPI ARD for SPI Arduino or the SPI bus from the Arduino. I've got those two interfaces then using this single interface which accesses the flash memory. And we're going to go ahead and dive down into this subsheet here. And this is our SPI MUX subsheet, which you'll see over here. And this is the multiplexer that we've selected, or what's called a bus switch. Now this one is the SN74 CBTL from TI. Uh, very, very good, very, very cheap, very easy to implement. But before we dive into this component and the wiring that we've done here, let's just take a quick sort of top level view of all of this. So recall, we've got two SPI masters. We've got the FPGA and we've got the Arduino both of which are competing for a single SPI slave, in this case, the SPI flash. That has a single SPI slave port. We have two ports that want access to that. So we need some means of arbitration, some means to ensure that only one device is ever accessing that single slave port at a time. The way we do that is through the addition of something called a bus switch, which functions very similar to a multiplexer. So the idea with the bus switch is, is that under one circumstance, it's going to put port B1 on port A, and another circumstance, it's going to put port B2 on port A, using a select pin to control which one has access. So, diving into the schematic, let's take a look at how that actually looks here. So here I've got port B1, here I've got port B2, and then on the other side I've got port A. I've got S, which is my select pin here, and then I also have an output enable, which is active low. That over bar indicates the fact that output enable is active low. Now, coming into the sheet, I've got my SPI config FPGA and my SPI ARD. So these are my two SPI buses, one from the FPGA, one from the Arduino, accessing then over here this single port on A, which is going to give me access to that SPI flash. Now, First off, notice that all of the pins are bidirectional. And this is by design. That chip itself, all of those pins are intended to be bidirectional. So it doesn't really care which way the signal is actually flowing on those pins. They're all intended to be bidirectional. So this works perfect for SPI, where we have master in, slave out, master out, slave in. So I've got data moving in both directions. Now, a couple of things when selecting a bus switch like this that we want to look at. First of all, we want to look at a power supply and get one in which the power supply works with the rest of our design. So the chip that we've selected here runs at 3.3 volts. Perfect. The other thing that we want to look at when we select one of these is performance. So we want to look at how fast can we actually run this thing. In this case, the chip that we've selected runs at about 200 megahertz, which is plenty fast for that SPI bus. We could get by with a couple of megahertz. In this case, we're talking 200 megahertz, plenty, plenty fast for access to that SPI flash device. And then the other thing that we want to look at is what sort of effect could this have on the signals? You know, in an ideal switch, the inputs 
are exactly the same as the outputs. But reality, that doesn't hold up. So we really need to understand what the net effect would be on the signals in the design. And if we take a look at the data sheet for this, you'll see that it's a 5 ohm switch. So very little impact to the signal there, and only a couple of picofarads worth of capacitance. So this thing is going to give you basically an output which is an almost one-to-one -one reflection of the input. So let's take a look at this table, which I nicked from the data sheet here. Uh, you'll see here that when output enable is low and select is low, A port equals B1 port. When output enable is low and select is high, a port equals B2 port. When output enable is high, the thing is disconnected. Nothing to worry about there, holds it in a high impedance state. For our circumstances, the FPGA should always be default connected to that SPI flash. It's only under the rare circumstance in which the Arduino wants access to that SPI flash that it should have to assert the select signal. So what does that mean? Well, the FPGA is connected to port B1. So we want to favor port B1 so select should be low by default, high only under the circumstances in which the Arduino wants access. And the way that we handle that, if we dive up to this top level sheet here, using a pull down resistor to pull select low. So default circumstance, default state, it's going to be predictably low. And under the circumstance in which the Arduino wants access, the Arduino is going to have to pull this select signal high. Now, the other thing is our output enable. Now, our output enable, recall, is active low. And in this case, we're just going to pull output enable down the entire time. So we're going to tie this to ground, and that's going to ensure the fact that we always have access to that SPI flash device. So very simple, very straightforward, not a whole lot more to it than that. But this is going to favor the FPGA always having access to the SPI flash and the Arduino only having access when it asserts that select signal. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look then at SRAM. And I've gone ahead and added an SRAM device to this design. Now this device also runs at 3.3 volts, it's an ISSI device, and it's 128K by 16, or a 2 megabit device. Now, alright, so let's take a look quickly at the costs and benefits of, say, SRAM versus SDRAM. Now, SRAM is much easier to implement versus SDRAM, largely because SDRAM requires that it is refreshed constantly. And the net of that means that it is much more complex to implement the core to be able to handle the SDRAM. It will also require more in the way of signal pins. So you're going to consume more of those signal pins on the FPGA if you chose to go with SDRAM. Now, one of the big trade-offs here, though, is that SRAM has a much smaller, and when I say much smaller, I mean orders of magnitude smaller total capacity. SDRAM has massive storage by contrast, but again, the complexity of SDRAM can sometimes favor implementing something using SRAM. SRAM is considerably more expensive, therefore, per byte than SDRAM. So if the only measure is how much does it cost per byte, you're always going to get SDRAM. However, it's not often that cut and dry. Now, SRAM is fast. We're talking about a 10 nanosecond device. That is extremely fast by contrast to SDRAM, which will be, as I said, orders of magnitude slower than the SRAM device. Now, the part that we've chosen here is this ISSI device, okay? And it's 128K by 16 or 2 megabit. Now, because it's 128K by 16, that means that we have a 16-bit data bus. That means that to write a 32-bit word is actually going to require two accesses. Now, there are some choices. We could do a 128K by 32, but that's considerably more expensive. The other thing is that they're going to require more I.O. pin than the 16-bit. So taking a look at that SRAM schematic over here, each one of those data bus pins is going to require access to one of the FPGA pins. And we were going to use this FPGA to increase the amount of I.O. with the Arduino. So that said, giving up 32 pins of our FPGA to our data bus doesn't make a whole lot of sense if we don't need super fast memory access. So that's a trade-off that we're making there very deliberately. 
Now, going back to our device over here, it's asynchronous access, which means that I don't need a clock line connected to this. Woohoo, one other pin that I get to save. And as I said, it's super fast, so 10 nanosecond performance. Now, the device that I've chosen has a common footprint, and you'll find this with SRAM devices even across different manufacturers. So Micron, ISSI, whole variety of different companies will use the same packages with the same pinouts on them, which makes it very, very easy to jump from one vendor to the next. So the device package that we've selected here, and this is on the bottom side of my board, is this 6x8 pin BGA, which is very, very common for SRAM devices. And Micron will make these, ISSI will make these, whole variety of different companies will have that same package with the exact same pinout. And that opens up a bunch of opportunities for us in the event that we wanted to expand the memory, or if we wanted to lower our costs and pull back on some of the memory, we can still use the same footprint and very simply just change out the part without any impact to the overall design itself. So, what all is involved in wiring this into the FPGA? Well, it's pretty simple and pretty straightforward, okay? I've got my 3.3 volt, three volt input, I've got my return here, I've got my address pins all broken out, I've got my data pins all broken out, and then I've got chip select, write enable, output enable, and my lower byte and upper byte. Down here, I've got my decoupling. And now if we jump up to the FPGA schematic, you'll see that I've got SRAM0 brought into that sheet. I've got all of those signals now introduced to that sheet here. And I've gone ahead and wired them into the FPGA in banks one and three. A huge advantage to the FPGA is that all of these signals are configurable internally, so I can map these signals to any I.O. pin on the FPGA device. What that means is, is that when I get over to PCB here, I can go ahead and very easily route out these signals to almost any pins and just move around my net labels and schematic to make the PCB layout much more convenient for me. Lots of simple straight point-to-point -point connections, very, very easy to implement, and makes for a pretty looking PCB. That said, that's really the extent of the SRAM implementation. Very simple, very straightforward to do. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the power supply and what's involved in the power supply design. So look forward to that. That should be ready here shortly. Thanks so much for watching. If you have comments, questions, concerns, considerations, anything like that, by all means, go ahead and stick them below in the video, or you can post them to my projects page under Hackaday Projects at projects.hackaday.com.